Hey Indianapolis Motor Speedway fans, Doug Bowles here. Hard to believe that this is episode number four of Behind the Bricks. How time flies when you're having a lot of fun, and we certainly are telling some stories and getting a chance to talk to some of the best personalities in the NTT IndyCar Series paddock, as well as here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Today's show's awesome just as well. We're gonna start out with Connor Daly. Hard to believe this year he will be attempting to qualify for his eighth Indianapolis 500. It's become a personality in his own right. Then we're gonna hear from Dave first, Dave's going to tell us all about the good news and the exciting news and the things happening inside of the NTT IndyCar paddock like only Dave can. And finally, Kara Adams, who runs race tire engineering and production for Firestone. She's also their chief engineer. You see her on the paddock working with the teams to make those tires so great. We get to hear from Kara about how important her job is, but also how important her job is inside of a month where we're honoring females across this country. So let's get things kicked off. A little bit of fun with one of our most fun personalities, IndyCar driver, Connor Daly. Thanks, Connor, for joining us on Behind the Bricks. We've been having some fun with our guests as we've been working through this. I'm gonna just start with the elephant in the room, only because I live with your mom. Talk about the haircut. Yeah, the haircut. Um, well, mom says this is her uh, payback for me having a bowl cut till I was like 18. Um, and I don't know why she doesn't like it. Well, I mean, I do know why she doesn't like it, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, she's one of the only ones that, well, there's, there's a very 50, 50, 50 split. I think it's now maybe more 75, 25, uh, 75% in favor of it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just wanted to try something different, something, uh, something that could be funny. Uh, I like making people laugh and this, you know, you know, it could be, uh, could be something that, um, is just uh, something that we we all enjoy that we laugh about that uh, it certainly seemed to get a lot of attention for the air force on media day and content day so uh, i think it all worked out well you know i haven't had an opportunity just to kind of watch you grow up and you've always been one of those people that are just really good with words and you put funny words together and that's really a, you know you've really kind of grown into that as you've gotten older and it's really one of the things that people love and and it's kind of connects a little bit to the hair Talk a little bit, bit about how the challenge of driving is what you do and it's what you love to do, but that's only 5% of what you do. 95% of it is how you market yourself, how you present yourself outside the car. And you've created this personality that people love to interact with. And a lot of it is the way you put words together and the humor that you have and hair. That talk. Why is that so important for a driver and why do you have so much fun with it? Well, I think in life, uh, it's important, uh, you know, to make people laugh. I think there's no one who's upset, uh, when they're, when they're laughing, obviously. And, and if, if I can, if I can create some fun content for people, enjoy people to enjoy, um, both on the racetrack and off the racetrack, um, that adds to the whole program, uh, you know, together. So you gotta be a brand. I mean, you gotta be marketable all across the board. Um, and you know, part of the reason why the U S air force, I think is, is, is still with us and can he continues to work with us. Uh, is because of that brand that I've that I've that I've been working on. So um, just trying to grow uh, every day and, and all the time. Uh, and it's it, it's exciting for me because I like to interact with our fans as well. Because I was a fan first before I was a driver. I mean, I've been an IndyCar fan since I was uh, you know I was born. So um, so I, I like interacting with the folks that support us to support our sport. I like interacting with the partners that support our sport. Um, whether it's my partners or other teams' partners. I mean. Uh, there are several several other people sponsors that I've I've enjoyed become friends with as well because they're you know they support racing and you know that's that's something we can all uh, you know we can all agree on so uh, it's just it, it's part of the package you got to be more than just a driver nowadays um, and I think that's something that I could just continue to try and work on. You know you talk about that personality one of the things that's really true about your personality and fits really well with with the brand of Air Force but also fits with really well with the brand of IndyCar. You are an American through and through, and you do take an awful lot of pride in the American flag and really telling the American story. And I see the photos behind you, and it's hard to not think about. You spend an awful lot of time in Europe, really running over there, winning over there. Not very many Americans have won in Europe on a European stage. And to, to some of the most magical moments I remember are you holding an American flag after winning a GP3 race. That's pretty special to you still. And you see it through even your humor and all you're doing. And the Air Force brand seems to fit perfectly with that love of America that you have. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I think when I was growing up, you know, there was a lot of American drivers that we were competing against. Um, but also, you know, lots of lots of foreigners had come over, uh, you know, to race in the Skip Barber series, to race in the Pro Mazda series when I was coming through. 
Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, anytime I went over to a formula one race, you'd see these flags of, of all the different drivers where there's, you know, the British flags for Lewis Hamilton, German flags for Michael Schumacher. When I was a younger kid, uh, Brazilian flag, you're such passionate fans, um, you know, rooting for their world champions. And, you know, there was, there was no American flags. And so, you know, when I went over there, um, you know, it was really cool to, to see, you know, a couple of times at a couple of different races when I was in Europe, you know, there were a couple of American flags, which I think was um, something super special. And it made me uh, really appreciate, uh, you know, representing, you know, your hometown, your home country. Um, and, you know, even still now in IndyCar, even though we're racing in North America, um, you know, there's a lot of drivers from all kinds of different places. So you still want to be the best no matter, uh, no matter where you're from, but, uh, but you know, to represent uh, you know, not only for the U.S. Air Force, but uh, for the USA as well is is, is super important and, and, and really, really cool. And, uh, you know, we've got guys in our series like, you know, Ryan Hunter Ray, who's called Captain America, which is really cool. And you've got Graham, obviously, who is, uh, you know, very, very passionate American as well. His cars are always red, white and blue. So um, so it's something that uh, I love. And obviously having the U.S. Air Force as a, as a partner of ours is, uh, you know, match made in heaven without a doubt a pole position for Carlin last year in with a team on ovals. You only ran part-time with them because you were running the rest of the time with Ed uh, and a team that isn't a Penske or an Andretti pretty amazing feat. When you look at that trophy behind you, what is that? What do you think about when that, when you see that trophy? I think the immediate feeling is you want more, uh, you know, it's a really, really cool feeling with the team and incredible, incredible effort from, from those guys. Um, you know, from our first year together in, in, in 2019, uh, it, it was, there was a great energy with that team. There's a, a great sense of, uh, passion for motorsport there. Trevor loves racing. All the guys there want to, uh, you know, want to beat the big teams. And, you know, we went out there and did that on that day, you know, in qualifying, which is, which is super, super important. Um, and, you know, obviously I think our next goal is, uh, you know, if we, if I get to race with those guys again this year, you know, we want to be on the podium. We want to be, you know, we want to be fighting for, for race wins and, you know, sadly, there's no more Iowa, uh, which which is brutal. Um, we were really hoping to come back to that track uh, again, but uh, but you know, there's still tracks like Texas and Gateway where you know Texas was actually our best finish last year in sixth. So um, you know, we wanna we wanna go back there and be competitive if if I get that opportunity to drive with them again. Uh, and Gateway is one of my favorite tracks. So realistically, you know, a team that has given me a great car every time out. Uh, you know, we, we know uh, what I think we need to, to be a little bit better race wise uh, rather than just qualifying. And um, it was a very, very special thing, though, to to accomplish and and to get their first IndyCar trophy for them as a team. I think it was really special. So uh, unforgettable, without a doubt. So getting to do the Indianapolis 500 with Ed has to be a special moment as well, knowing how popular Ed is. In, with our Indy 500 fan base, you being a local driver has that same sort of popularity. So connecting those two, but then when you take how much, how important the Indianapolis 500 is to you, you've grown up, your dad raced the Indy 500, obviously me being involved with racing as well, your mom loving racing so much. I don't think you've probably known a day where the Indianapolis 500 wasn't important. In fact, 2014, you came back from Europe knowing you were gonna miss the race and fighting traffic going the wrong way just because you wanted to say you were at the facility on race day. So when you get a walk down the grid with Ed and you know Ed can be so fast, how has that dialogue gone between the two? I know last year didn't turn out the way you wanted, but you still have to be encouraged by the fact that you and Ed come to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. If you were putting favorites down to be one of the fastest teams, definitely Ed Carpenter Racing fits in that even today. Well, I certainly hope so. I seem to bring him bad luck because I thought Ed was on the front row every single year and then me and him were qualifying in the 20s together. So I don't, I don't know if I brought that on the team, but uh you know, it's something that I think um, Ed and I were very, very similar in what we wanted out of the car. And, and we both didn't, um, you know, we both didn't have what we, what we wanted. And, and we both struggled a little bit in qualifying. I think, um, you know, in the race, obviously, Ed got taken out lap one as well. So it was just a rough, rough year for, for us across the board. Um, but, uh, but there is a lot of positives there. I think they know, obviously, how to be fast there. Uh, they've been on the front row many, many times. Ed's had many pole positions there. So, there's no reason to think that we, you know, going into the, the month of May, we'll be competitive. You know what I mean? I think that's the goal. That's the, that race means more to them than anything. And, and it means more to us than anything. So, uh, so it's, it, it's definitely a group that I feel very confident being with. Um, and I think, you know, we've learned a lot since the last time we drove at the Nam Speedway. 
And thankfully, we've got a couple test days as well there to, uh, you know, to, to get things going again. And, um, you know, we, we have to be positive because, uh, you know, it is Ed Carpenter Racing at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and everyone expects us to be fast for sure. One of the things you've done a great job at over the last few years, and especially over the last 12 months when we've all been stuck at home, is finding other celebrities from different areas of the world and turning them into IndyCar fans. So whether it's somebody like Travis Pastrana or working with um, guys that are racing motorcycles, you've been able to use your platform of, of your internet gaming to really bring new fans to the IndyCar series. How much fun has it been to get to interact with these other celebrities and other drivers or other athletes at different levels and then introduce them to our sport of IndyCar racing? Well, I think that's the that's our main priority right now is make people aware that we are racing Indy cars. Uh, I think that's our, our biggest struggle is, you know, people know about NASCAR. People don't know about IndyCar. Uh, we're, we, we don't have the, 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 the arms to outstretch to, uh, you know, to, to be as powerful as, as the, the bigger organizations do. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's our job as drivers and teams to do that every day. I mean, you, it, it, it will take a lot of work, but you got to do it. And, you know, interacting with these people, uh, you know, from different sports, uh, different motorsports, but now also different sports. You know, I just joined a, an esports team with with Austin Eckler, the running back for the Los Angeles Chargers. Uh, a lot of different NFL players on that list. Um, you know, that, that's on the same team as me, and you know, want to get those guys out to a race. Want to have those guys come check things out. Uh, you know, all the two wheel guys that we got to interact with. I mean, huge names. I mean, Ricky Carmichael, Chad Reed, Travis Pastrana. Um, some incredible guys uh, that 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 I've always been fans of and and they love racing everything themselves. So uh, I think just, you know, get, getting our names out there, getting getting people uh, to turn on an IndyCar race to, you know, to support the homies is is, is really cool. And, um, you know, it's, it's going to take more. It's going to take more of that. And, you know, I'm always, always going to be selling IndyCar. I mean, I'm always going to be telling people, look, you guys got to come to race. You guys got to check this out. Um, because you can tell them all about it, but until they see it in their, you know, with their own eyes, it's, uh, you know, that's where I think we really sell people is when you're at the track, you're, you're involved, you're seeing what's going on here, seeing how crazy and technical this sport is and how exciting it is. So I, uh, I will always be out there, you know, pushing, uh, you know, pushing IndyCar to everyone that I meet. And it's been cool to create a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of new relationships over the, uh, you know, over the, over the 2020 year, which we all thought sucked, but realistically, I met a lot of incredible new people and, um, you know, it's, uh, the future is bright. Well, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Best of luck in the 2021 season. It's going to be a lot of fun as, as I think it's you that, uh, that called me and said, it's amazing just the, the momentum that the IndyCar series has with the number of drivers who are coming, F1 drivers, NASCAR drivers, guys like you who are, who have been in the series for quite a long time. So there's an awful lot of excitement this year. Any last words you got for the fans of the NTT IndyCar series? I mean, just exactly what you said. We've got some of the best of the best from all around the world coming to compete in IndyCar this year. NASCAR champions, current Formula One drivers, um, V8 Supercar champions. I mean, this is this is truly some of the best of the best. And I think it could be one of the most exciting seasons ever. So we obviously want everyone to support us, the U.S. Air Force wagon, uh, Chevrolet cars. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, so we'll see what, what happens this year, but we're excited about it. Well, thanks so much, and we'll look forward to seeing you at Trackside, and have a great day. And I can't tell other drivers this, but since you're my stepson, I'm going to tell you, I love you, man. Thanks for all you do for our sport. <laughs> thanks, Doug. Always a lot of fun talking to Connor Daly, and it's not very often that I get to tell a driver I love him, but since he's my stepson, I felt like it was an appropriate thing for me to do. Well, next, we're going to get an opportunity to talk to Dave first. Lots going on in the IndyCar Series right now. We've got some of those iRacing races behind us, more to come. Something that we started last year, getting to do it again this year, that's an awful lot of fun. But also talking about Women in History Month and some of the things where women were really involved in making our sport as great as it is today. Dave? While the testing continues on racetracks, the first competition of 2021 will come off it. It's the return of the IndyCar iRacing Challenge, season two, a return to the fun and colorful moments and a build-up to the 2021 NTT IndyCar Series season opener, April 18th at Barber Motorsports Park. Races will come Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. Eastern from March 18th to April 1st. Live streaming will be available on IndyCar.com with secondary channels available on the driver's social accounts. Chip Ganassi Racing's Alex Pillow is among those ready to go. 
I cannot thank Chip Ganassi Racing enough to be able to be part of them. And, and come on, the teammates I have this year, six-time IndyCar champion, seven-time NASCAR Cup champion. I have Marcus and I have Tony Canan as well there. So it's going to be a good year. Uh, hopefully I can learn as much as possible from them. And hopefully we can keep winning even on the real track. Two-time NTT IndyCar Series champ Joseph Newgarden helps lead a stellar lineup, which also includes series and Indy 500 champions Ryan hunter Ray, Simon Pagino, and Will Power. Two-time 500 winner Takuma Sato will also be among those competing. Meanwhile, our series saluting Women's History Month continues on IndyCar.com. This week, catching up with seven-time Indy 500 starter and 1992 Rookie of the Year, Lynn St. James, who will never forget how she was welcomed to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Particularly on this whole issue of women in racing and, and, and other diverse populations, people of color, is that this sense of people feel they're not welcome. Well, if you show up, I believe this, if you show up with the passion and an interest, first an interest, because maybe you're not passionate yet, but with an interest and you really, it's genuine, um, the people who are there, the existing stakeholders, the existing fans, the, they will embrace you. And our series on Women's History Month wraps up next week with Danica Patrick. I'm Dave First for Behind the Bricks. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate you keeping us up to date on the things going on in the NTT IndyCar Series. You know, I really enjoy having an opportunity on race weekends to run into Kara Adams. Brilliant person, passionate about our sport, and she always has an inside angle on what the tires are doing and a pretty good idea on who's going to be fast and who's using those Firestone tires to their maximum capability. Had a lot of fun sitting down talking to her about how important that Firestone tire is to our teams, how Firestone is more than just a tire company, but a technology company, and then talking about Women in History Month and how she feels like her place has a small part in it. Let's talk to Kara Adams. Maybe we just kick it off and start right with the title because your title is a, is a pretty cool title, right? You get to be the race tire engineer, the director of race tire engineering for one of the greatest uh, racing brands in the world. Um, talk a little bit about the responsibility that goes along with that title. And, and, and you're, you know, we see you throughout the paddock interacting with teams and drivers and engineers across the board. Does that title ever just, that, is there a lot of weight carrying that title around? There certainly is a weight, a lot of weight. So we've got director of race tire engineering and manufacturing. So like you said, it's one of the greatest racing brands. We have so much tradition of amazing race quality over the years. 1911, back with the Marmon Wasp at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, we were driving to victory lane on those fires on tires. So there's a great legacy that's been handed down to me and to my team, and we take that very seriously. So this is all of the design and engineering and manufacturing that goes into those IndyCar tires you see run around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway at speeds of up to 240 miles per hour. So it's, it's pretty, pretty big. So I, one of the things I don't know that everybody understands, so it's not, you don't just build one tire and then replicate it for the entire season. I mean, you have to think through the track itself, you know, what's the asphalt like, or is it a street circuit where you've got a combination of asphalt and concrete and it's, and, and it's bumpier and then temperature of the venue that you're going to run comes into. So over the course of the season, how many different variety of tires do you end up bringing to the races? Well, in a typical season, we could see up to 70 different di types of specifications. So everything that you see when you see a car in the racetrack, every single position of the car is different. So the left front and the right front, they may look the same, but they are not the same. So if you switch them on a road course, you might get an unhappy driver. If you switch on an on an oval, then you might have a significant issue. So we always try to make sure we can mark everything really well left or right. So every time they're on the car, there's different. So we have primary tires and alternate tires in the IndyCar series. So those red sidewall tires, even though they look like the same and they're the same construction, they've got a different compound on them. And then we have rain tires in case it rains. And the tires for a street course are very different than what you would see at a right side oval or super speedway. So we've got a lot in our inventory. With 2020 being as interesting as it was, we condensed our amount of offerings that we have. So we had one street course primary set of specifications, one alternate, one rain spec, and then a few different road courses, and of course a different different tire for each oval. So I think I think people don't. So you, so you test all year round, right? So we think of our fans obviously know when there's an open test, which is every team can come to you, and that's really more about the teams testing things. 
but you test throughout the year at different venues and what's really a private test and it's really a, a tire test that, that Firestone manages through. So the purpose of that is so you can understand if the tire compound and construction is gonna work for that particular setup. And then when you decide it is, then you have a whole manufacturing process you have to get in. So, so it's not like you can test in a, on a Wednesday and be racing that tire on the next weekend. So you, you, you are busy all year round thinking about our race season in order to make sure you're meeting those, those demands of the, the different tires at each venue. Yeah, let's take Indianapolis, for example. We are starting to work on our 2023 Indianapolis tires right now. We're looking ahead to 2022, what we're going to be doing in 2023. So the design cycle is a little bit further out, yet we can be proactive and we can be reactive if we need to be. So if something changes, if there's a new aero screen or something, something changes on the car that's significant that affects the performance of the tires, we are relatively quick at being able to adapt those. But yes, just because we make a, we see something that might be different, we might want to change something, it takes a while to actually go through the full manufacturing and design cycle. So we do rent the tracks out. We look at renting IMS. We look at renting, we may be renting a road course as well this year. So it really depends. There are a lot of not vehicle tests that we do as well. So off vehicle tests, we'll do tests on a, a flat track. It's like a belt with the, we're running a tire almost on sandpaper to understand the, the characteristics of it and help the car, the drivers and the car engineers understand what's going to go on with their vehicle. So absolutely a year round process. We're designing all year round. And even though we have an off season where we're not at the racetrack, our engineers are very busy. What's a race weekend like for you? I know you, at that point in time, you've got your tires in. As you're walking up and down pit lane, what are you thinking about? Who are you talking to? What are you trying to learn? And what what fires are you, do you end up having to put out? Or can you get through a weekend without worrying about fires? What's, what's race weekend look like for you at a given IndyCar race? You know, the more boring, the better. <laughs> it, but inevitably, there's going to be some questions. There's, somebody's going to try something new, something different that other people haven't tried before. Um, you, you can have something, any from thing from last year at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway during qualifying. Um, one of the teams decided that they were going to stand up the tire and, and do something where it really wasn't in the design of the tire to ever be sitting at absolutely zero camber. If you think about a race car, if you look at it, you know, from the front, you have the, the tires tilted the top towards the inside of the track. Um, and one of the things that one of the teams decided to do was to stand the tires right up right and that went that way when they're actually running they're running on the very inside edge which is not what a tire was designed for so we always have things that we have to adapt to based on people are always looking for ways to go faster people are finding more creative ways that's why these brilliant engineers are in the roles that they're in they can they can always push the limits and figure out what they need to do and then we have to be able to react to that so if it's something like somebody running a tire in a situation where we don't expect um, or whether it is just cars going faster, additional loads. We're always looking to see what we can do. During the race weekend, really, if there's something that goes wrong, really what we can do is make a recommendation. Okay, don't do something silly with your, with your car. But we would look at them and say, all right, you're running your tire with zero camber. That doesn't make sense. It's safe to do, but you're not going to like the tire in the long run if you do that way. So there, there's basically, we're at that point, we're making recommendations. In an oval, we may have backup tires or something, but in general, what we're there is making sure people are running the right pressures, making sure people are not doing something silly with cambers and just really monitoring the overall performance of the tires. And as you said before, it's a year round design cycle. So a lot of what we're there at the racetrack, our engineers, we have engineers and we have compounds, chem chemists, um, all at the racetrack, they're all looking at that performance and that'll help us into the next year's design. So we've had an opportunity to talk a little bit about, about our Indy Autonomous Challenges coming up and the importance of technology. And it was interesting in one of the conversations we had, we think of you as a tire company, but Firestone thinks of itself as a technology company. Talk a little bit about that component of, of, of what's going on with Firestone and why it really is a technology company and it isn't just a rubber company. Yeah, at one point we always used to say, all right, we're the number one tire and rubber company in the world. And then we kind of evolved to, okay, we're maybe more of a research company. And then really looking at the, the future and the needs of not only the industry, but the needs of the world in the future, we need to be able to support a, a connected, autonomous, shared and electric, electrified vehicles. Um, even our the, the founder of Bridgestone always talked about serving society with superior quality. 
So it's really not about making tires or selling tires. It's how do we serve society? Because a company that's focused on helping out society as a whole is always going to do well with what they're going, what their main product that they're selling is. So we always talk about technology. Uh, we've got some amazing technologies within Bridgestone, even not within race, but in other areas where we have sensors and tires, there's a lot of connected um, and we're working a lot with autonomous tires designs and, and some really neat state-of-the-art stuff. And we're working to see how we can implement that in racing. You know, racing is the ultimate proof point for technology. So you see things that show up at the racetrack that you've never seen out on the road. Take the rearview mirror in 1911. That was a, mm -hmm. a great innovation there. So we're always about innovating. We're always trying to make sure that we can we can serve society. And that's that those are, are some of our goals. And it's nice to see those translate into racing. Yeah, it's it to me it's amazing really how it is more than just the, the tire company and it's been it's been fun to learn from you guys. So March is Women in History Month, and we're trying to highlight women who are important in our sport. And you are one of the most important people in our sport, and you just happen to be a woman. Uh, talk a little about the challenges that that you faced in a male-dominated industry. It's getting better for sure. But you are one of the most important people in our paddock in terms of getting our cars on track and making sure, uh, making sure that that they're fast and, and that they're safe. What's it been like over the last 15 years of your career, being a female in a male-dominated sport, and especially now when you are really leading the way for the bulk of the the bulk of the paddock? So it's, it's interesting, Doug. I grew up in a family where my mom was a science teacher and my dad was a language professor. And I always thought as science is the, that was, that's what the girls do because that's what my mom did and my dad did languages. So in my mind, science, science was always associated with females. Um, I went to school and there was a, maybe about 20% of females in my graduating mechanical engineering class. And then you move into a company like Bridgestone who hires a lot of females. So we had a pretty good representation here. And then moving into um, IndyCar for my first year, and there have been so many amazing women that have come before me. We've had even engineers and chemists from Firestone even before I got here that were doing similar things to what I did when I started. Um, and then we've had engineers that have been around the paddock in IndyCar and ChampCar for, for many years, but just not at the time that I moved into it, their role. So when I started, there were no female engineers anywhere in the IndyCar paddock. So this is uh, many, many years ago. We won't say how many years ago. <laughs> but when, when I started, I thought that was really interesting. And for my first two years, I kept thinking, all right, I'm going to eventually see somebody that's in, somebody that's a female that's in engineering. I'm, I've got bound to see it. And then my first interaction with someone from Delara was very embarrassing. So I got very excited because I saw an email come across say it was coming from Andrea Toso, who we who we know we work with, but I didn't, I hadn't met him before. And I see the email and I'm like, oh, Andrea, oh, this is great. We have another female in engineering. I need to make sure she feels welcome. I'm gonna reach out to her. I send an email saying, hey, I haven't seen you at the track, but if you ever make it out, um, stop by, I'll introduce myself, but you know, we'll make sure I show you the ropes and everything like that. And he was very nice about it. He said, oh, I'm Italian, it's pronounced Andrea. Um, I, I, that was a really nice of you to offer, but it's been really interesting over the years. We have a group of women that work the Indy 500 that are engineers um, and some of the mechanics. We actually try to meet together once or twice a year and then support each other. It is a great support network. There are some amazing, very smart women in that group. And we help other women who are trying to get into the sport as far as engineering. We'll try to make sure that they have connections, any, any questions they have or hook them up with the team. So it's been really good to be able to help provide that support to people, even if their name just sounds like a female's name. But you now we have, we have Danielle and we have um, Amanda from Andretti and of course, Kate and, and some of our Anna Chatton, who is an uh, engineer as a mechanic and Anna Davies from the Firestone side. So it's really great to see all these women in motorsports. And Doug, you may know, every year we try to take a picture out on pit lane. And you know, even with COVID kind of social distanced, we, we did it this year as well. Um, we are up to 10 engineers and mechanics uh, that worked at the Indy 500 this year. So we only expect that number to go up and it's, it's really been amazing. So yes, have there been some difficult things? Sure, but it, has it been really rewarding to see the face of IndyCar change? Um, IndyCar is so focused on diversity, which we love and it's great to be part of that. 
Speaking of diversity, so Beth Peretta announced Peretta Autosport. Have you been involved at all with that program? Obviously, you're going to be supplying the tires for them. And how have you known Beth for a while? It's a pretty exciting announcement that we made. And she just made an announcement on a primary sponsor for the team for yes. the Indy 500. We're looking forward to having that. Is there a little bit of pride that you've got in the fact that, that Beth's going to be on track with her own team? Yeah, it's always great to see women doing well in the sport, whether it's Sarah Fisher owning a team and Beth and her very female-focused team. Um, when we were involved when Grace Autosport were the original program that she was she was trying to launch, um, that was that was really phenomenal. But to actually see it happen this year is great. We support all of our all of our teams, of course, but it's it's always good to see other women succeed. Well, race fans, there you have it. We don't get to have the Indianapolis 500 or the NTT IndyCar Series without knowing that we can rely on the folks at Firestone and the tires that they put on these race cars. So these drivers can just worry about driving. They don't worry about the tire performing for them. And Kara, thank you for leading that. Thank you for leading an amazing team. I know it's not just you. You've got an amazing team that helps you. But thank you for the partnership. Thank you for caring about our sport. And we can't wait to see you in the paddock soon. And thank you for spending the time with us. All right. Thank you very much, Doug. Well, that's about a wrap for show number four, the fourth time we've had Behind the Bricks. I want to thank Connor and Dave and Kara for spending some time with us, talking to us fans and helping us understand why the sport's important to them and helping us connect even more. Please follow us on our IMS social channels. We'll keep you up to date. There'll be more of these Behind the Bricks for you to pay attention to. You can find it all on those IMS channels. Also follow those folks at the NTT IndyCar Series. That season is just around the corner. We can't wait to see you at Barber. We've got a little more iRacing still to do this year as well.